Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, pericardial disease. So basically, we have the layers of the pericardium. We have the fibrous pericardium, which is the outer fibrous layer. And then you have the serous pericardium. It has a parietal layer, which lines the outer fibrous layer there. And then there's a visceral layer that covers the heart and the great vessels here. And it's the space between those two layers. That's the pericardial cavity. And that normally contains a small amount of fluid, about uh, 15 to 15 milliliters of fluid there. So you have the fibrous pericardium, which is that part on the outside. And then uh, you have the serous pericardium. And it is the space between the visceral and parietal layers, between the visceral and parietal layers of the serous pericardium. That's where the pericardial fluid is. Now, we also have subepicardial fat. So we have fat over here beneath the epicardium. So that's between the myocardium and the pericardium. That surrounds the coronary arteries, the veins, and the nerves. And we have somewhat more of that in the cardiac grooves and the convexities. And that actually helps you to visualize the pericardium. So you can see that pericardial layer there between the epicardial fat and the mediastinal fat. So the normal thickness for the pericardium is about? Three millimeters. It's about two millimeters, but that's close. So two to four is the gray area, greater than four, then that's definitely considered abnormal. So sometimes you can actually see the pericardium on a lateral chest radiograph. So that thin little stripe is the normal pericardium. And again, if you have enough epicardial fat and mediastinal fat, that will outline that. So normally it's about two millimeters or less than two millimeters thickness. And then we can also see it on imaging. Usually it's easier to see over the anterior border of the heart. See here, here it is on CT. And then on MR also, we can see that the fat is bright here on these images. And so that pericardium is that thin dark line that's outlined between the epicardial fat and the mediastinal fat. And here's another nice example. There you can see the pericardium there between the epicardial fat here, which surrounds the coronary arteries, and the mediastinal fat. Okay. All right, so we'll start with this case over here. Anybody here see anything unusual? Opacity in the retrosternal space? No. Yeah, so there's an opacity here, right? Do you see it on the frontal view? Like yeah. A, like a where is it? It's like where the descending thoracic aorta would be? Or on this side? Yeah. No. <laughs> Do you see it on the frontal view, anybody? No. On the right. On the right where? How, what would you describe? How would you describe that region? This is called... Oh. Yeah, so in the right cardiophrenic angle here, right? There's a opacity, okay? And then there it is on the lateral view. So what do you think that's going to represent? Pericardial What? Pericardial Well, it's not round, right? And another clue that you have is it's pretty easy to see the blood vessels through it. Fat. Yeah. So this is going to be fat. So what does that represent? That represents a prominent fat pad. So you can have these fat pads in the mediastinum uh, at, the at the cardiophrenic angles, okay? And easy diagnosis with CT. But on the plain film, the clues are, it tends to have this kind of triangular shape on the lateral view. It's overlying the interior border of the heart on the lateral view. On the front of view, it's kind of ill-defined in terms of the edge, but also it's easy to see through it. You can see the blood vessels through it because it's fatty in attenuation, it's fatty in density, okay? So you can have these, you can have these pads, you can have these fat pads in the apical region or sometimes in the right cardiophrenic angle, like uh, it lies in the case that, that we saw. Okay, uh, anybody at St. Barnabas, what is the arrow pointing to? Okay, anybody at Beth Israel? What is that? Yeah, so what do we call that? Which pericardial recess is that? 
Well, it is, it is part of the transverse uh, sinus, so it's a superior pericardial recess. Um, there's also an oblique sinus that, that's behind the pulmonary veins. So that superior pericardial recess, or some, sometimes called a superior aortic recess, that's the one that is most commonly seen on CT scans. So it's part of the transverse sinus. These are these folds of pericardium here that uh, wrap around. It extends from the SVC on, on the right there and goes around towards the pulmonary artery behind the aorta. So the superior pericardial recess is part of that. And this is very easy to see on CT. There's also the oblique sinus, which is posterior here between the pulmonary veins. That one is not as commonly seen on CT. But this, the superior aortic recess, you want to recognize it. It's fluid and attenuation. It's in this characteristic region right behind the ascending aorta, kind of between that and the pulmonary artery. So you, you don't want to mistake that for lymphadenopathy, you don't want to mistake that for dissection. So we don't want to mistake that for any kind of pathology. Now sometimes these pericardial recesses can come up very high, almost to the level of the aortic arch. And so you don't want to mistake that for a dissection. Uh, you can follow it down to the pericardial space. So if you do sagittal reconstructions, you can kind of follow it down. It's also fluid and attenuation that helps you. So you don't want to mistake a prominent pericardial recess like that for any kind of pathology. So over here, guys, is this a nodule? See that? No. What is it? Uh, it's like a pulmonary venous recess. Or like a yeah, so, the, so there's pericardial recesses also can, especially this one, can wrap around the undersurface of the right inferior pulmonary vein. And so if you happen to catch that on an axial cut, it can look like a lung nodule here, all right? So uh, it's important to recognize that it's part of the pericardial recess there that's wrapping around the pulmonary vein. And then again, if you reformat the views, nice sagittal view here shows you that it's part of the, uh, it's wrapping around the right inferior pulmonary vein, okay? All right, anybody at uh, Beth Israel? No? St. Barnabas? Sonoria. You guys over here? Sonoria. All right, so that's the Oreo sign. So it's a sign of what? Yeah, so on the front of you, the heart's somewhat amorphous here in shape, which can help, right? But on the lateral view, so what is this lucency here? That's the epicardial fat. What is this lucency here? That's the mediastinal fat. All right, this is epicardial fat here. This is mediastinal fat here. So this area in between this thickening of the pericardial stripe, this is the pericardial fluid. And so they call this the sandwich sign or the Oreo sign on the lateral view. So this pericardial fluid here is outlined by epicardial fat here and the mediastinal fat, and that's what forms the sandwich, so that patient has a pericardial effusion. So the signs of a pericardial effusion widen pericardial stripe. You can have rapid change in the cardiac size and contour, the water bottle heart, the amorphous shape of the heart on the frontal view. You can have normal pulmonary vascularity despite cardiomegaly, so or the enlargement of the cardiac silhouette on the frontal chest radiograph. So usually if you have heart failure causing an enlarged cardiac silhouette, you would expect to see pulmonary venous congestion as opposed to pericardial effusion. Obliteration of the retrosternal clear space, widening of the subcarinal angle, all of those are signs of pericardial effusion. But that sandwich sign, the Oreo sign, is really a kind of pathomonic for pericardial effusion. So here's enlarged cardiac silhouette from pericardial effusion. Here's an enlarged cardiac silhouette in somebody with CHF. You can see this patient has more pulmonary venous congestion because of the CHF. That's actually causing actual enlargement of the heart, whereas here we're just looking at pericardial fluid that's causing the enlargement of the silhouette there. So the sandwich sign, we want to recognize that. Easy diagnosis of effusion on CT, you can see that nicely. And on T2 weighted MR, it'll be very bright and signal. Okay, so we can see that also. Yeah, 
the differential diagnosis when you have a chest x-ray that, that looks like this, right? So what are some things in a differential diagnosis? We just saw one, right? Which was big pericardial fusion. What else? So cardiomyopathy, right, that causes diffuse enlargement of the heart can also do that. Multivalvular disease, also because you have, you know, much more than one chamber that would be enlarged to give you this kind of appearance here. Sometimes a large anterior mediastinal mass that drapes down over the anterior surface of the heart can also mimic cardiomegaly on the frontal chest radiograph. What kind of mass would that be? What? No. Thymic. Origin? What so what kind of mass of thymic origin? Thymolipoma, right. So a thymolipoma draping down over the anterior mediastinum can also sometimes mimic enlargement of the heart. So this was a big pericardial effusion. So you always want to think about that, especially if there are rapid changes or sudden changes in the heart size between one radiograph and another radiograph. Okay, over at St. Barnabas. Anybody there? Okay, go ahead. So where's the fluid collection? Is that a pericardial fluid collection? Yeah, it is in the pericardium. Now, how can we tell that? Well, what, what am I pointing to here? What is this? Yeah, so that's the myocardium, the anterior myocardial wall, the right ventricle. What is this stuff here? Nope. Guys? It's epicardial fat. Yeah. that it's outlining this, what is this guy? This guy? That's the right coronary artery. So this is epicardial fat. So these then, out here you have the mediastinal fat. And so right between you have the pericardium. So these, mm -hmm. by the way, what do you think of the thickness of the pericardium here? Yeah, so both layers are, they're thickened, right? And you have a collection and you have septations in a collection. So what are we thinking about? What could this be then? So this could be, so you could have an abscess in the pericardium, a bacterial infection. Is there anything else that would be in the differential diagnosis for this? Well, blood shouldn't give you septations like that unless it's, uh, well, I guess, unless it's chronic, right? But anything else? Guys? Pericarditis, but... Well, we said that. We said kind of infected. Neoplasm, right? So if you have metastatic disease and you have neoplasm here, that can, although you wouldn't expect it to be so smooth, but that can also give you complex fluid collections like that within the pericardium, right? So this was bacterial pericarditis here on the dark blood imaging. You can see the thickening of the pericardium and kind of the, the stuff that's in there, the debris that's in there. It's bright on T2-weighted images. And you have the septation, so that was a bacterial pericarditis. Um, okay, anybody at Beth Israel? No? You guys here? What's abnormal? What's abnormal? Besides the pericardial effusion? Well, what about the pericardial effusion? You're just going to say that's per pericardial fusion next case? or It's more dense. All right. It's high in attenuation. What does that suggest? There's some gunk in there. High attenuation pericardial Blood. fluid should make you think of hemopericardium, right? So what's the differential for hemopericardium? What can cause hemopericardium? Rupture. So... You're talking about what? Trauma, dissection. Dissection, dissection yeah. right? Trauma. Is there anything else that can cause hemopericardium? Bleeding tumors. 
What's that? Malignancy, right? So if you have metastatic disease with hemorrhage, that can do it. Uh, and so there, there are other causes. Sometimes it can be spontaneous from anticoagulation, although that's very rare. Okay. So these are the various causes of hemochlorocardia. You can also see it after acute myocardial infarction, trauma, dissection. Sometimes it can be associated with renal disorders. And on T1-weighted imaging, you can have high, high signal there because it's blood, okay? So this is a epicardial hematoma in this case, secondary to myocardial infarction. In this patient, you can see the areas of enhancement here, and then this area over here, so that you have more simple pericardial fluid, but then inside of it, you have this uh, different signal representing blood here within the pericardial space. So sometimes this can also occur after myocardial infarction. You can get hematoma from that. Okay. So uh, over at St. Barnabas, what happened here? And well, it's a little more than hemopericardium. That's even brighter. We're really not. Yeah, we're really not showing you the right atrium here. Not, you know, not a good look at it. But what are we showing you? What What can you say about? the attenuation of this fluid. Why is it so bright? Why is it so bright? Why is, this is contrast. So there's actual rupture here where the contrast itself is actually leaking into the pericardial space, right? So it is hemopericardium, but in this case, it's even more complicated than that. There's actually contrast leaking in there because of uh, this uh, rupture dissection. This one. The superior vena cava. So you have the left brachial cephalic vein going across to the superior vena cava. Here's the aorta here with the section flat. All right, so guys over here, why, did, why does this patient have the pericardial effusion? Why do you say TB? So there is a cavitary lesion here, right? But with TB, the cavitary lesions are usually located where? Uh, upper yeah, usually they're more in the upper lungs. So what could that cavitary lesion be then? Cancer. Cancer. Right. So this is malignancy. In this case, there's a cavitary lung mass here. So this pericardial effusion then is from metastatic disease. This is a patient with lung cancer who has this pericardial effusion because of the lung cancer, okay? All right, so you guys at St. Barnabas, this patient is status post motor vehicle accident. So we'll look at these images here and tell me if you guys have any ideas. Okay, are we going to stop there, or is there more to say? Okay. That's part of a chest tube. So we have, we have hemopneumothorax on the left. There's pneumopericardium. So then the pneumopericardium is an indication of what? What does that tell you? That tells you what? Guys, what does it tell you here? Not a bronchial injury, no. What is, what is the fact that there's pneumopericardium tell you? Disruption. There's disruption of the pericardium, right. So in a trauma case, when we have pneumopericardium and disruption of the, by the way, what do you think of the shape of the heart? Yeah, so the heart is distorted in shape. So if we see that in somebody with trauma and pneumopericardium, how do we make sense of that? Tension. Anything else? 
Yes. So this is this is herniation. So the, the complication you need to be concerned about is the heart herniating through the pericardium, and that's causing the distortion in the shape. And that's that's exactly what they found when they explored when they explored this patient. Right. So the so there's the pericardium as we're coming down, right? So here's the air in the pericardium, and then you see the heart looks like it may actually be outside. This portion of it may be outside of the pericardium. And so that distortion in the shape of the heart can be an indication of herniation of the heart through the pericardium in this patient with trauma. And obviously that's very serious because it can constrict the heart itself and impair cardiac function and put the cause the patient to go into shock, okay? So, another example of pneumopericardium after trauma. So it's an indication that the, there's been disruption of the pericardium. And if we have, in this case, there is no distortion in the shape of the heart, but if there is distortion in the shape of the heart, then you need to worry about herniation. So here's another example of uh, going along with that prior chest X-ray. This is pneumopericardium here from disruption of the pericardium in this patient with trauma. Okay. Here's a massive pneumopericardium there on the plain film. And then this person actually has an air fluid level here in the pericardium. Air and fluid. So this was after pericardiocentesis. So there's an air fluid level there in the pericardium. Okay. All right, so this patient has chest pain, ST elevation, and these findings on MR. What do we think? Over here. Pericarditis. Yeah, so this is acute pericarditis. So how do you know it's pericarditis? Uh, it's you got hmm? high contrast in the pericardium and well, this is post contrast. There's there's enhancement, right? There's pretty impressive enhancement here of the pericardium. So this is pericarditis, acute pericarditis. There's inflammatory pericarditis with that marked enhancement of the pericardium. So you should not see pericardial enhancement like that on MR. That's abnormal. And usually it's associated with inflammatory conditions affecting the pericardium. So this is a patient with acute pericarditis. This is some mild thickening of the pericardium, not that much. But it's the enhancement here that really helps you uh, with the diagnosis here of acute pericarditis. Here's another patient who has enhancement of the pericardium. So you can see that pericardial enhancement. Okay. So why is the pericardium enhancing in this patient? There's a pericardial enhancement there. Okay. So what would you look for in the myocardium? What would you look for in the myocardium? You said ischemic, so. Does this patient, does this patient have a myocardial infarction? Does this patient have a myocardial infarction? No. Yeah, so here's the myocardium here. Here's enhancement. All of this is enhancement of the myocardium here on the interventricular septum, all right? What's the dark stuff? Yeah, it's microvascular obstruction. So this is an acute myocardial infarction in this case. And so in this case, there's an acute myocardial infarction, and that's associated with pericarditis, causing the enhancement of the pericardium. So this is pericarditis secondary to acute myocardial infarction in this patient. So this patient has a history of myocardial infarction four weeks ago, now has chest pain. You notice the heart, the cardiac silhouette there appears enlarged. There's a left pleural effusion. So what are we thinking about here? Dressler syndrome. So Dressler syndrome is uh, when, these, when these patients can develop a pericarditis after myocardial infarction. So it's post-myocardial infarction syndrome. They can have pericardial and pleural effusions, you're two to 10 weeks. The effusions tend to be left-sided. Pericardial effusions might be hemorrhagic, can be prolonged and recurrent. So these patients require treatment with steroids to prevent complications of the pericarditis. 
A similar thing can occur after surgery. That's called postpericardiotomy syndrome after cardiac surgery. So these patients also can have an immunologic-related re uh, reaction. And it's thought that at surgery or at infarction, some of these antigens, uh, the immune system comes in contact with them. And so that results in an immunologic reaction causing the pericarditis. So some autoimmune hypersensitivity to pericardial or myocardial protein. And these patients also can have pericardial effusion and pleural effusions, and again, it can respond to steroids, okay? All right, so over at St. Barnabas, what do we think of this case? So what makes you say tamponade? Yeah, so there is so there is a large pericardial effusion, and you do have collapse of the right atrium and distortion here in the shape of the heart, especially those right-sided chambers. So when we have a distortion of the chambers like that, especially the right-sided chambers and collapse of the right atrium there, we need to think about tamponade. And so here's another nice example of that. You can see short axis view there, here, and it's kind of a four chamber view, big pericardial effusion, and then all of that distortion here on the, here on the right ventricle and also here on the right atrium. So uh, these are examples of tamponade. So the fluid in the pericardial space compresses the heart, decreases venous return to the heart, especially the right side of chambers. Heart size can be normal if the pericardial fluid accumulation is acute. There is no pulmonary edema associated with this unless there's left ventricular failure, although you can see dilatation of the SVC, IVC, and the azagous vein. So for cardiac tamponade, we look for large pericardial effusion, compression of the right atrium and the right ventricle, diastolic collapse of the right ventricular free wall, right atrial compression during the release systole, uh, inversion of the ventricular septum, and as you said, you can have distension of the inferior vena cava and the hepatic veins. This is a patient who had a stab wound to the chest. Initial chest x-ray looked okay, but six hours later, we have this rapid enlargement there in the shape of the, or the size of the cardiac silhouette. So this was a large pericardial effusion, hemopericardium in this case, because of the stab wound to the chest in this patient, okay? Guys over here, what do we think of this? Is there any finding? Okay, so what am I pointing to? What is this guy? What is this guy? Right, so that's the myocardium, the anterior wall, the right ventricle. This guy over here is? RCA. Right coronary artery. What is this stuff? Fat. Where? Epicardial fat. Epicardial fat. What is this out here? Mediastinal fat. Mediastinal fat. So now do you have something to say? Nope. Still nothing to say. Well, what's between the epicardial fat and the mediastinal uh, fat? Pericardium. What do you think of that pericardium? markedly thick, abnormally thick, and here it is on the coronal view, right? There it is on the coronal view, but marked thickening of the pericardium. So what could that be associated with? What complication can we get if we have marked thickening of the pericardium like that? We can get what? Pericarditis. What kind? Constrictive, Constrictive pericarditis, right. This one is also enhancing, indicating that there's an inflammatory component also associated with this. So typically, we, when we're thinking about constrictive pericarditis on the plain film, we look for calcification. calcification. Sometimes it's easier to see on the lateral view. So you have this, whenever we see extensive calcification or calcification of the pericardium, we need to be thinking about constrictive pericarditis. So in this case, what is the evidence on the CT that this patient has a physiologically significant constrictive pericarditis? Uh, contrast in the IVC. Well, what do you think of the size of the IVC? 
permutations to extend it. We, we can see the calcifications here in the pericardium, right? And what about the cardiac chambers? What do you notice when you look at the cardiac chambers? Well, what is this guy? And what about this guy? Yeah, so compare that to the size of the ventricles, right? So we do have some enlargement there, especially the, the right atrium and the IVC. So that's evidence. Also, if you think that there's any distortion in the shape of the chamber, that's also evidence that you have a physiologically significant constrictive pericarditis. So thickening of the pericardium restricts the diastolic filling. It can be from pericarditis of any cause. It can be postoperative. You can see it from any of these causes too, prior inflammation, uremic pericarditis, or even radiation therapy. It can cause pulmonary venous hypertension from increased left atrial pressures, and uh, it can mimic restrictive cardiomyopathy, which we talked about last time. So don't confuse the two terms. The exams love to confuse you between restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis. Clin clinically, they can appear similar. So it is associated with pericardial calcification, 90% with constricted pericarditis will have pericardial calcification, 50 to 70% with pericardial calcification have constricted pericarditis. This is on the plain film, okay? So we look for pericardial calcification, look for flattening of the right heart border, thickened pericardium on imaging studies, dilated atria on imaging studies, all of that is evidence of constricted pericarditis. Chunky calcifications like this can be caused by what etiology? TB, right. So TB is a common cause of constricted pericarditis worldwide. So it tends to be associated with chunkier calcifications like we see in this case, okay? Uh, but pericardial calcifications can come in like in, in all forms, in all shapes. Sometimes, again, easier to see on the lateral view. So if you see that, Think about it. But as we've said, if there's distortion in the atria or the shape of the ventricles, then uh, or dilated IVC, then it's evidence that it is physiologically significant. So here there's dilatation of the coronary sinus, dilatation of the IVC. So that's telling you that this patient has a physiologic significance, even though there's very mild thickening of the pericardium in this particular case. Okay. Here's a case with distortion of the ventricle. There's distortion there of the right ventricle. You can see the pericardial calcifications here. Not much thickening of the pericardium, but with distortion of the ventricle, then it's evidence that it is physiologically significant. So if the pericardium is greater than four millimeters thick, then that's evidence of constricted pericarditis. So if we see that on our imaging study. Here's an example where the calcifications are giving you dark signal on the MR in this particular case, but there's distortion of the shape of the right ventricle here, uh, telling you that it's significant physiologically, okay? So guys over here, what, what's happening in this case? This kinetic left ventricle? Well, what, what, is, what is the patient doing here? Breathing. Yeah, so we asked the patient to take a deep breath, okay? What are, what are we looking for? So we have a short axis view. We ask the patient to take a deep breath. What is it that we're looking for here on this sequence? Remember, this lecture is on the pericardium. Well, well, what's abnormal? Uh, yeah, so what happens is the interventricular septum should remain convex towards the right ventricle because it reflects the pressure gradient between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. So Pressures in the left ventricle should always be greater. So the interventricular septum should always remain convex towards the left ventricle, towards the right ventricle. Here, when on inspiration, there's flattening of the interventricular septum. All right? So what does that mean? Well, what's the diagnosis going to be then? Constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis. So this is what normal should look like. You ask the patient to take a deep breath, okay? Notice that the left ventricle stays round. The interventricular septum stays round. Here the patient takes a deep breath, and then you have flattening. So this is constrictive physiology. So what's happening is with constrictive pericarditis, the pericardium is thick, 
and that restricts filling of the heart. When the patient takes a deep breath, that increases the venous return to the right-sided chambers. And so the right ventricle dilates, but because the pericardium restricts the amount that the heart can dilate, the left ventricle is restricted in terms of how it can dilate. So the interventricular septum then shifts or flattens out towards the left ventricle. So that is constrictive physiology. So this maneuver doing, uh, you know, asking the patient to take a deep breath and looking for flattening of the interventricular septum on MR, they do the same thing on echocardiography. We can do the same thing on MR. We're looking for evidence of constrictive pericarditis. We're looking for that constrictive physiology, right? Do we see this with restrictive cardiomyopathy? No. No, right. So this, this is something we see with constrictive pericarditis. Okay. So this has also been called the septal bounce. Notice how there's flattening here, and then it kind of bounces back to normal. So uh, it, it's accentuated with inspiration, which is why we like to do an inspiratory maneuver on MR. And it tends to be greatest towards the base of the ventricle. So constrictive pericarditis on MR is associated with that septal bounce. But we can demonstrate it nicely if you, like, as we've done with the short axis imaging and a deep inspiration. So this patient didn't have that much thickening here of the pericardium, but there is uh, constrictive physiology when we do that inspiratory maneuver here, okay? Okay, so at St. Barnabas, what do we think of this case? Anything to say? So how do we put how do we put the findings together here? So what are the findings on the plain film that are associated with congenital absence of the pericardium? What are the findings on the plain film? That's 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 not something that I mean if you can do that it's not something we really look for on the plain film but so the findings of absence of the pericardium on the plain film are what? Number one, the heart is shifted towards the left side, right? Number two, what's underneath the heart? Lung, lung. Because of the absence of the pericardial attachments, lung tissue can get underneath the heart. So that lucency underneath the heart is lung tissue getting underneath the heart. So that's two of the three findings. And the third finding is what? Well, we said that it shifts to the left side, OK? No, that's because of the lung getting underneath the heart. Notching in the AP window, all right? See, that lung tissue gets into the aortopulmonary window, again, because of the lack of pericardium there. So those are the three findings on the play film associated with the absence of the pericardium. Heart shifted to the left side, lung tissue gets under the heart, and lung tissue gets into the AP window, causing the notching there of the aortal pulmonary window. Nicely demonstrated here on the CT. You can see the lung tissue getting into the aortal pulmonary window. The heart is deviated towards the left side, and on this coronal reformat, you can see the lung tissue gets underneath the heart because of the lack of the pericardial detachments there. So those are the findings of absence of the pericardium, congenital absence of the pericardium, okay? So the larger defects are more common than smaller defects. Uh, more common in males, the importance is the association with other anomalies. So it's associated with ASDs, VSDs, bicuspid aortic valve, mitral valve prolapse, you know, congenital lesions like PDAs other diaphragmatic lesions like diaphragmatic hernias and also an associated with bronchogenic cysts. So association with these other abnormalities, we can also see that with congenital absence of the pericardium. So we've gone through, uh, you know, the findings that are associated with absence of the pericardium. Uh, so I guess the uh, heart deviated to the left side, lung tissue underneath the heart and lung tissue getting into the aortal pulmonary window. Now, a rarer defect is absence of the pericardium over the left atrial appendage, and that can cause herniation 
of the left atrial appendage through that defect that can cause strangulation of the left atrial appendage. So partial absence of the pericardium over the left atrial appendage, that's rarer than, you know, the, than the complete absence, but that can be associated with strangulation of the left atrial appendage, okay? All right, so over here, anything abnormal in this case? Yeah, we see this big round mass here next to the heart. And so the diagnosis is? Pericardial Yeah, so that is a pericardial cyst. Okay, so these can occur in the cardiophrenic angles. So usually fluid attenuation on CT, uh, very bright on T2-weighted imaging, can be higher in, 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 in signal than fluid on T1-weighted MR. But it's very bright on T2-weighted MR. So these are pericardial cysts. These do not communicate with the pericardial space. So uh, usually in the cardiophrenic angle, more common in the right than the left cardiophrenic angle, usually a fluid attenuation, and so they're pretty easy diagnosis, okay? So over at St. Barnabas, what do we think of this case? Over here? I see anything abnormal? There's a mass. There's a mass, right? <laughs> that is enhancing, right? And the mass is extending into the pericardial space. What do we think that is? Met. Met, right. So metastatic disease is always more common than any primary tumor that affects the heart of the pericardium. So this is metastatic disease to the pericardium. But if we're, going to, if we're going to talk about primary pericardial tumors, what primary pericardial tumor can look like this? No, myxomas are not primary pericardial tumors. Myxomas occur primarily in the left atrium. Yeah, this is mesothelioma. So mesothelioma can occur in the pleural space, it, it can occur in the peritoneal space, but it can also occur in the pericardium. So this is mesothelioma. So pericardial effusion, markedly thickened pericardium, kind of all this mass-like uh, uh, densities there within the pericardium, that's mesothelioma. Uh, so usually, you know, you have soft tissue masses, you have pericardial effusion, thickening of the pericardium, so it's uh, obviously malignant appearing tumor. Some question or not whether it's related to asbestos exposure, just uh, you know, as opposed to mesotheliomas uh, of the pleural space. So pericardial mesothelioma, if you have soft tissue densities there in the pericardium, pericardial fluid, and thickening of the pericardium. Again, metastatic disease is still more common than pericardial mesothelioma. This is a patient who has chest pain, has this opacity there adjacent to the left heart border and gets a CT scan that looks like this. So, so it's, an, it's an infarct of what? Pericardial yeah, fat. that pericardial fat pad, right? That pericardial fat pad there. So, and that can, that, that, you know, patients can show up with chest pain. So a lot of these patients get PE scans for chest pain, okay? So that's called epipericardial fat necrosis. So it may be from pedicle torsion or, you know, it's, uh, many times we never figure out what really caused it, but sudden onset of chest pain and there's necrosis here of the fat. It is self-limiting, it goes away on its own. So sometimes it can get swollen and you might see a little mass like that on the plain film. But on CT, uh, you have the fat is infiltrated, some thickening around it and some infiltration there and inflammatory changes within the fat, so it's an encapsulated fatty lesion like that adjacent to the uh, pericardium. And it goes away, it gets better on its own, so at presentation and then six weeks later, it kind of resolves all on its own. So that's epipericardial fat necrosis. Patients can present with acute chest pain. Another example, CT at presentation, and then six weeks later, it goes away on its own. All right, so that is our discussion.